In this video, we're going to take a look at some examples that show us how to use the second part of the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. So remember that this part of the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus is the part that actually allows us to evaluate definite integrals and find exact answers. So if we're trying to integrate from A to B some nice continuous function, we'll call it f of x, we know that we can compute the antiderivative of the function, which we'll use capital F for the antiderivative, and evaluate the antiderivative at the upper limit of integration, and then subtract the antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit of integration. So that's f of b minus f of a. So really, to compute definite integrals, we have to be able to find antiderivatives. All right, so we know that these are definite integrals, remember, because we have limits of integration. So we have an integral from 2 to 4. That's what makes this a definite integral. And the first thing we want to do is double check that the function is continuous from 2 to 4. So x squared is definitely a continuous function. It's continuous over all real numbers. So we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus part 2. So the antiderivative of x squared will be 1 third x to the third power. Remember, we add 1 to our exponent, and then we are going to divide by that new exponent. And then let me just show you the three different notations for the next part. This is our antiderivative. One option is to put it in brackets and put the 2 and the 4 here, like I, I'm doing. And this is showing that we're going to substitute in 4, we're going to substitute in 2, and we're going to subtract the results. But let me just show you some alternative notations in case you run into these in other videos or other textbooks. Sometimes they'll take the antiderivative and just do a right-hand bracket like this. So that's another way of, of writing the same thing. And sometimes they'll even take the antiderivative and just do a vertical line with a 2 and a 4, like so. So these are basically three ways of symbolically communicating the same thing. So it doesn't matter which one you choose. I'm just going to go ahead and choose the, the very first one that I had written, where I have the antiderivative in brackets on both sides. And so now we're just going to substitute in 4. So 1 third times 4 cubed and then substitute in 2, which is 1 third times 2 cubed, and then just subtract the results. So that's going to be 64 thirds minus 8 thirds, which will leave me with an exact answer of 56 thirds. Perfect, let's look at the second example. So in this second example, example B, we're finding the integral from 6 to 3. So notice here that my limits of integration are in the wrong order. We want to have the lower limit of integration be the smaller value. So I'm going to go ahead and start by interchanging my limits of integration. And when I interchange the limits of integration, I multiply by a negative. And then I'm also going to rewrite the integrand. Instead of 2 over x, I'm going to rewrite this as 2 times 1 over x. Now let's think about the 1 over x. If I were to rewrite that as x to the negative first power, and then if I were to try to find the antiderivative by adding 1 to the exponent, like we did in the previous example, remember that would leave me with x to the 0 power, which would equal 1, and clearly that is not going to work. And that's not working because remember that 1 over x, we have to have his antiderivative, oops, try again, <laughs> We have to have the antiderivative of 1 over x memorized. This is an antiderivative that we should recognize. Okay? The antiderivative of 1 over x is going to be the natural log of the absolute value of x. So I'm going to keep my negative on the outside. Here's my antiderivative, the natural log, absolute value of x. Don't forget that 2. Let me stick that 2 out in front, sorry. 2 times the natural log, absolute value of x. And then we are going to substitute in those limits of integration, 6 and 3. So I'm going to keep that negative on the outside. So substituting in a 6 will leave us with 2 natural log, but absolute value of 6 is just 6. Minus, when we substitute in 3, that's 2 natural log, absolute value of 3, which is just 3. 
Now you could certainly leave your answer like this, but I want to show you how most people are going to continue to simplify this using properties of logarithms. So both of these terms have a 2 in common, so I'll go ahead and factor out a 2. So we would have negative 2 and then the natural log of 6 minus the natural log of 3. And then if you can remember your properties of logarithms, which I realized was for a while back for some of you, when we have two logarithms that are being subtracted, we can actually combine those together and divide the arguments. So this would turn into the natural log of 6 divided by 3, which is really just the natural log of 2. So another way of writing this would be negative 2 times the natural log of 2. And you can see that's a much simpler way of writing our answer instead of writing it as this long quantity that we had a couple steps back. But these are equivalent. If you were to put these both in your calculator, you're going to get the same decimal approximation. And then some people will even go one more step farther using properties of logarithms. And again, I personally don't require this, but I want you to see this in case you look at the answer and realize that your answer looks very different than, say, the answer in the back of the book. And so another property of logs allows us to take the coefficient, in this case that's a negative 2, and rewrite that as the exponent of the argument. So if we did use that property of logarithms, then my answer would look like the natural log of 2 raised to the negative 2 power. But 2 to the negative 2 power is really 1 over 2 squared, which would be the natural log of essentially 1 fourth. 1 over 2 squared. So that's also the same as the natural log of 0.25. So these answers are equivalent. They're just two different forms. And in fact, they are indeed equivalent. Let me highlight all of these. They're equivalent to the, the answer we had in the very beginning here, the negative 2 times the quantity natural log minus natural log of 3. They're just kind of condensed versions using properties of logarithms. So all three of these answers would be acceptable, and they're all equivalent. Let's look at another example. So how about the integral from negative 1 to 3 of dx over x? So I am going to rewrite that integrand. And instead of dx over x, I'm just going to read that, rewrite that as 1 over x dx. Again, I'm doing that so I can really take a look at this integrand, this function, 1 over x, and think about what the antiderivative may be. But I do need to pause here because 1 over x is not a continuous function. And actually, let me, let me look back at our previous example here. Here we did have 1 over x as well in our integrand. And l let's just discuss this back in this example and then we'll go to example C. 1 over x is not continuous, so it's in fact, it's discontinuous, you could say. It's discontinuous at x equals 0. Remember, you can't divide by 0. 0 is not in the domain of this function. However, for this example, on example B, we were integrating from 3 to 6, and so 0, where we had that discontinuity, it wasn't on that interval. It wasn't between 3 and 6. And that's why we were able to use the fundamental theorem of calculus on example B. But if we go back here to example C, we notice here we're integrating from negative 1 to 3, and 0 is right in that interval. It's between negative 1 and 3. So we have this discontinuity between negative 1 and 3, which tells us we cannot use the fundamental theorem of calculus on this problem, we cannot find the antiderivative and proceed like we've done on the last two. So this is actually going to be an integral that is undefined. So we say this integral doesn't exist. So we can write d and e for doesn't exist. And again, if you want to write a supporting statement of why, why does this integral not exist? It's because we have a discontinuity at x equals 0. So we can say discontinuity at x equals 0. There we go. And specifically, this would be an infinite discontinuity if you wanted to be uh, very specific about the type of discontinuity.
So important to remember, always check to see if the function is continuous on the given interval. All right, example D here says we're integrating from 1 to 2, a much more complicated function. Now we're integrating 3 minus w to the third over w to the fifth. Now remember, when we're computing an antiderivative, you cannot compute the antiderivative of the numerator and the denominator separately. That doesn't work. Think of that. That would be like trying to compute a derivative of the top and bottom separately, which we cannot do. That would require the quotient rule. So I always ask myself if I'm uncertain whether or not I can do something with an antiderivative. Was it okay to do that with derivatives? And if the answer is no, it's not going to be okay to do that with antiderivatives. So on this problem here, I need to do a little bit of preliminary algebra. So before I write my integral down, I'm going to go ahead and do um, preliminary algebra. In other words, I need to see if I can simplify or rewrite in some way this function. So 3 minus w to the third over w to the fifth. Since I'm dividing by w to the fifth, which is just a monomial that just has one term, I could go ahead and divide the two terms individually by w to the fifth. My, my five is not coming through, sorry. Let's try that again. So that would be like what I call term by term division. So three divided by w to the fifth minus w cubed divided by w to the fifth. Still having trouble with the five. <laughs> Time for a new stylus. All right, so this is really going to be the same as 3w to the negative fifth power minus w to the negative second power. So I have done a little preliminary algebra. I've rewritten the integrand. And now this new integrand, since it's written as two separate terms, this is the integrand that I will use. So we are computing the integral from 1 to 2 of 3w to the negative fifth power minus w to the negative second power dw. So now we can go ahead and compute our antiderivative. And again, reminder, we are adding one to our exponent and then we're going to divide by that new, new exponent. So if I add one to negative five, negative five plus one will give me negative four. So that means I'm going to also divide by negative 4. So that would be negative 3 fourths w to the negative fourth power. Same thing with w to the negative 2. I'm going to add 1 to that exponent to compute the antiderivative. So that will be a w to the negative first power. But then if I divide by a negative 1, that'll change this to addition. So plus w to the negative first power. So this is my antiderivative, which I'm going to put in brackets. And now we will substitute in 2, substitute in 1, and subtract the result. And while I know we could technically do all this substitution on the calculator, I'm going to go ahead and forge ahead and show you the computation by hand. So we're going to basically have two quantities, and then we're subtracting. So if I substitute in 2, 3 fourths times 2 to the negative fourth power, plus 2 to the negative first power, and then I will also substitute in 1. 3 fourths times 1 to the negative fourth plus 1 to the negative first. Now, just a reminder that those negative exponents, if we're doing this by hand, negative exponents are going to push that 2 into the denominator. So this is really going to become negative 3. If I take the 2 into the denominator, 2 to the fourth power is 16 times the 4 that's already in the denominator. So that would give me 64, negative 3 over 64. And then 2 to the negative first power is 1 over 2, so 1 half. And then um, if I do the same thing for the second quantities, we're just taking 1 and putting that in the denominator. So that's just going to end up being negative 3 fourths plus 1. So get a common denominator, and I think we're about there. We are going to multiply what, by 32 to get a common denominator of 64. So that's going to leave me with a negative 3 over 64 plus 32 over 64, which will be 29 over 64, minus 
negative 3 fourths plus 1 is just 1 fourth. And then one more common denominator and we would have our exact answer. So multiplying by 16 over 16. So 29 sixty fourths minus 16 sixty fourths is going to leave me with 13 sixty fourths. And again, I know that computation could all be done on your calculator, but just wanting to show you the whole thing done by hand to this nice exact answer. Last one, let's look at an example that has some trigonometry. So the integral from pi sixth to pi thirds of tangent theta, secant theta, d theta. So let's first look at these limits of integration. So pi sixth is 30 degrees and pi thirds is 60 degrees, so the limits of integration are in the correct order, the smaller one on the bottom, the larger one on the top. Let's check for continuity. Tangent um, is definitely going to be continuous on that interval, and since secant is 1 over cosine, we know that uh, 1 over cosine, that's only going to be undefined when the denominator cosine is equal to 0. And that is not going to happen here between 30 degrees and 60 degrees. So we are good to proceed with the fundamental theorem. So the antiderivative of tangent theta secant theta is just secant theta. So we'll evaluate secant theta at pi sixths and pi thirds. And we will subtract our result. So secant of pi thirds minus the secant of pi sixths. Now here, if we were to go to our calculator, we would get a decimal approximation. And if we're interested in exact answers, here where we, is where we actually need to compute these uh, by hand, if you want an exact answer again. So I'm going to rewrite secant as 1 over cosine. So that's 1 over cosine of pi thirds. And that'll be 1 over the cosine of pi sixths. So we definitely have to come back to some units, uh, unit circle trig here. Again, pi thirds, remember, that's 60 degrees. So this is 1 over the cosine of 60 degrees. And if you remember, the cosine of 60 is 1 half. So this is going to be 1 divided by 1 half. So that's really going to turn into 2. Minus 1 over the cosine of 30 degrees. And the cosine of 30 degrees is rad 3 over 2. So 1 over rad 3 over 2 will really give us 2 over the square root of 3. So I would accept this answer. This would be perfectly fine for me. 2 minus 2 divided by the square root of 3. But again, a lot of instructors might want you to get a common denominator. If you did that, then you would have 2 rad 3 minus 2 all over the square root of 3 another equivalent answer. We could even go one step further if you had an instructor that didn't want you to leave a square root of 3 in the denominator. If they wanted you to rationalize the denominator, we certainly could do that as well. I'm not going to go there because I am fine with this answer here. 2 minus 2 over the square root of 3.